The Antifada is more than a podcast. It's a specter haunting the globe. It is the synthesis of the two most frightening things for the cheerleaders of this reactionary hell world. One ravaged by the unbounded savagery of capital and its states. Antifa super soldiers and intifada. Bash the bash in a global uprising. Be prepared to enter the Antifada Mindset. I'm Jamie Peck. And I'm Sean Kirby. And we are broadcasting not live from Leftist Best Headquarters, about a half hour walk away from the gentrification ravaged Guanas Canal in the coastal elite bubble of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. So we're very happy to have some friends and comrades in the studio today. Uh, I'd like to introduce Doug Henwood. Hello. Good to be here. Doug is many things. He has his own wonderful podcast, which we love a lot. Uh, called Behind the News, which you should be familiar with. And if you're not, please check it out ASAP. He's also a contributor for Nation Magazine, has written many, many great articles and books. I think uh, the one that we'll talk about a little bit today, uh, perhaps his most controversial book, was called uh, My Turn, How I Undermined the Most Qualified Candidate in History and Became a <laughs> Russia Bot. It's all my fault. <laughs> well, you, you put the subtitle right there. Uh, we also have, uh, as well, uh, Liza Featherstone. Oh, hey, great to be here. Also a uh, contributor to the nation, uh, also a teacher, a lecturer, uh, and uh, another author of a somewhat controversial book. This one was called um, The Internalized Misogyny of My Fem Brocialism, <laughs> The Faux Feminism of Hillary Clinton that came out uh, in that the, election the season. The Faux Feminism of Liza Featherstone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got our numbers, man. basically. <laughs> you really set yourself up for... Uh, yeah. for yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, how, really, how could you be surprised that anyone got mad about that? <laughs> no, I, I was definitely not surprised. You're trolling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On that topic, uh, you know, I think you, you've got a lot of hatred from uh, a lot of people in the last couple of years uh, because of the principled uh, stands you both took around the same time when it came to um, our late uh, great uh, Democratic flag bearer uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton, uh, the great, wonderful <laughs> liberal. Um, so you want to talk a little bit about what the fallout from that was? Who goes first? <laughs> um, well, I, I was actually going to say, um, I, like, I think that... Um, Doug got far more hatred for that than I did, perhaps surprisingly. Um, I think that um, that the um, the left critique, the left feminist critique of Hillary, was something that um, the mainstream liberals so didn't want to hear that they actually didn't even want to criticize me because that would be too you know, make that critique public and visible. Um, so, so I actually found a lot of. Um, um, I, I was um, ignored a lot um, and, um, and Doug was attacked a lot because he was an easy target as a white male. Yes, um, of course, nobody actually <laughs> read the book. I mean, no. Uh, and it was barely <laughs> reviewed. They did uh, look at the, the cover, though. They oh, did. yeah, they, they judged the book by its cover, which yeah. was <laughs> a painting by a woman who had uh, an erotic obsession with Hillary Clinton. Mm. Uh, which it was like a years and years cover. and years. It was really bad. Uh, based on a publicity still from Natalie Wood. It was a movie in the early 60s. Huh. Um, but nobody read the book. I mean, Katha Pollitt wrote a really dumb review for the nation's website in which it was clear she'd read no more than three pages of the book. Wow. Uh, mm. And uh, you know, it was just all phantoms. Uh, and you know, it would have been nice to p if people actually engaged with the book and found some justification for hating me but it was all just unjustified hatred that i experienced well it makes sense because uh they can't do their disingenuous id paul thing on liza so much yeah. uh, this is like a classic well i mean it's not exclusive to the clintons but it's definitely a clinton move to try to paint all criticism as bad faith criticism right. and something that comes from like sexism or racism lol so well, like that, that it was harder to do the, that. The, the Hillary's positioning in the campaign, though, she represented women with a capital W. Yeah, uh, and if you didn't like her, you didn't like women. Uh, I'm with her, right? That yeah. was the that was the big thing. Yeah, yeah, and I think that the the false choices critique. I mean, it, which which I should say was a collective one. It was an anthology, and so it was a um, a wide range of. Self-hating uh, women. Of, of, yeah, self-hating <laughs> women, um, you know, women of color, sex workers, like a, people coming from a variety of different perspectives. Um, and, um, um, you know, so it was very 
hard, I think, for the um, f for the mainstream to respond to that as if it were some kind of a misogynist um, um, you know, effort. And and in in fact, and in in some ways, it was even hard for them to criticize it as well. This is going to help the left, the the right. Or, you know, this is going to help the Republicans because um, what I mean, who is going to read this perspective from sex workers and <laughs> right. queer women and all these people and be like, <laughs> right obviously, <laughs> I should vote for a Republican. Uh, know, Trump I mean, especially. Was, <laughs> Vladimir were, Putin we, works in mysterious ways. <laughs> he does. We should always talk, remember that. Talk about twelve dimensional yeah. yeah. dimensional chest there so it was in some ways by being somewhat bulletproof but from 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 those kinds of critiques although i did receive them but you know was it, but some but a little bit more bulletproof um than um, than some of the other um, critiques were um but sometimes by um you know by having the critique that is more insulated you then have the critique that is more invisible so uh, it, went, it was a little bit um, down the memory hole yes. yeah. well, well, you know, I was working on the book too and it started as an, uh, an article for Harper's so it had a, been a couple of years in development and, and in its birth and <laughs> arrested <laughs> uh, lifespan uh, the, um, I kept telling my liberal friends who are now my former liberal friends like, regardless of what you think of Hillary she's a terrible candidate, she has lots of vulnerabilities nobody likes her, the more people see her the less they like her and you may regret all the support you threw to her and I, you know, I turned out to be right I'm not happy with the consequences but I turned out to be right and I just didn't want to listen to that part of it at all and, they, and even uh even though you you turned out to be correct on that uh, assessment, uh, even after her incredibly miraculous loss to an incredibly horrific candidate, they still won't engage with the argument that she was a bad candidate. Right. It's always some excuse, obviously, we know. That's you the know. worst part. Like, sorry to interrupt you. No, no. <laughs> I just got fired up. I get fired up when get we're talking up, about this. Fired up, fired like, up, ready to go. We are fucking leftists. We aren't even that invested in the success of the Democratic Party. We're telling you assholes this for your <laughs> own good, and you won't even listen. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. No, that was the, that was the amazing part. I I found um, I think people got even madder um about critiques after the election, like th that because I because I wrote a few things oh, yeah. after that you know ex explaining um why this um th why this bourgeois white feminism was um it why it was you know you would think that it could have beaten trump but it in some ways made sense that it didn't that was the article you wrote in uh, the national review called how i took down exactly. the cackling uh, hell beast exactly uh, <laughs> it sounded better in the original russian <laughs> it, 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 it sounded, sorry it go sounded, on it sounded much better in the original <laughs> People were yeah. very sensitive, you know. They just suffered a great trauma. Yeah, exactly. And people were so traumatized that there was a. There, well, I would admit I wanted to kick him lower down. Yeah. I mean, there was a pleasure in that. I mean, <laughs> it was a mixed pleasure because we have to suffer from Trump, who's just right. a fucking horror. I mean, yeah. I don't want to like, you know, there's nothing good about him at all. Uh, I know. And even, you know, you go back to his campaign where he was talking about, like, he's going to bring the jobs back and he's, like, not going to get involved in uh, um, foreign wars and he's going to, like, rebuild the infrastructure instead of, like, spending on cruise missiles. You know, he's, like, reversed anything that was slightly good about him is completely down the toilet. And now he's just and now a he's revolting even, pig. He's even talking about uh, uh, going back on the TPP thing, you know, that free yeah. trade agreement. Mm -hmm. Now there's some rumbling mm -hmm. about that. Wait, we, I have one more question for Liza. How many Bernie bro boyfriends did you get as a result of stabbing your fellow women in the back? <laughs> <laughs> that was really the main reason I did it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's yeah. just like Madeline Albright says. Yeah. You know, you just here for <laughs> well, that sweet, count, sweet Bernie right? bro D. Yeah, of my Bernie bro yeah, yeah. boyfriends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, I was going to ask Tatiana. It really asked, brings the boys to the yard. <laughs> <laughs> I asked Tatiana that question off air, and she's like, uh, I'm a lesbian. <laughs> It's like, uh, yeah. can we get a gif of Joanne Reed's head exploding? Yeah. Jamie, I think it's an appropriate time now for you to ask our guests the question that we always ask them. Mm, yes. Um, so we like to take the temperature of the room when we do these things um, and ask a question that we got from our dearly departed comrade, Alexander Coburn. And that question is, how pure is your hate today? <laughs> <laughs> Boundless and 105% 100, <laughs> pure. Excellent. 
Liza? Um, yeah, same. Um, <laughs> r- really um, very pure hatred. Wonderful. 99 and 44 one hundredths of a percent pure. Yeah. Like a dove bar. Yeah. Like a dove bar of yeah. hate. <laughs> a beautiful, yeah. lovely dove bar. Uh, yeah. um, I, I thought we weren't taking sponsors on our show. Oh. I know that dove. It's actually ivory. Oh, it's uh, right. whatever. You're gonna, you're I, f- I fucked it up. It's fine. No, we dodged that bullet. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't sell out by accident. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, if they wanted to send us the money, we'll use it to fund the rev. Whatever. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So uh, at this point in time, I guess this is our hard lunch episode. So I should let you guys know that hopefully by the time this is finished being edited, our show will be in the iTunes store. That's right. You can listen in your Excited. podcast app. That is very exciting. We also set up a Discord community for our patrons and patronage because we're all working people here. It starts very cheap at $2 a month and that gets you access to the Discord community. Um, As cheap as a dove bar of hate. Yes, exactly. (laughs) You can can use it to talk to us or submit questions or talk to each other. It's it's cool. It's chill. Yeah, we love to take uh, suggestions and feedback on the show and the Discord. It's a really great way for uh, us to engage with you and for uh, our patrons to engage with us. Yes, and we also have just figured out our first patron reward. Whoa, what is that? Because Mm. most of... This content is free for anyone who wants to listen, and you only have to give us money if you want to. Uh, but we want to reward our patrons with extra stuff. So um, I'm I'm pleased to announce when we hit the arbitrary number of 183 patrons. We thought 200 was way too boring. 183. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. Uh, no slouches in numerology here. We just, <laughs> we just picked 200 it. less a prime number. Seems like a really good number. You do the math. Um, <laughs> we will release the world historical debut of our cooking show. It, it is called Acid Kitchen. <laughs> yeah, I think Matt's working on the sound levels right now. I think I need some subtitles too. I don't know if he's going to be able to do that, but... Yeah, I think you guys are really going to like it. I think I think we'll leave people hanging uh, with the with the con- concept of acid kitchen, and we'll <laughs> reveal a few more details. Whatever could uh, it as be? As time goes on. <laughs> so, um, I one of the things that we did off of uh, Discord is uh, because, as we mentioned, Liza has a uh, advice column, uh, socialist feminist advice column in Nation Magazine. Is we put it out there for uh, our patrons to submit questions, and uh, we picked the best one. I have the question have in front of me. I have it too. Oh. Yeah, actually, Doug, 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 Doug could read it. I could read it. Pinch oh, hitter. Yeah. You you read that's it? actually really good. Let's have Doug ask All right. that question. Yeah, because it's also it's a man. Dear Eliza, I have a friend who, amongst other things, spouts, spouts junk racial science, men's rights, activist politics, and divorce, polemics and divorce court, and leaves me with the impression that he categorizes women in sexualized ray, ways, e.g. Asian dragon lady, Slavic <laughs> Natasha, and frigid <laughs> lesbian. <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> I want that lesbian dragon lady. (laughs) As a vanilla, non-revolutionary, cis male person of color, I had the luxury of trying to slow walk him out of this way of thinking about women. But should I take a more direct, confrontational approach? My assumption is, if he gets his defenses up, it will be harder to plant seeds of doubt to slowly but fundamentally dismantle the scaffolding that holds up these garbage thoughts. Advice, please. Sincerely, Nam Danette, patron. All right. I love this question um, because the letter writer already kind of knows the best approach to this. And so I just get to say, I I think he's taking the right, uh, I think he's taking the right approach. Um, One of the great things about, I'm I'm pretty much assuming that this is an in-person friendship. And one of the great things about hanging out with people IRL (laughs) is that um, you can over time um, you um, plant these slow seeds. You know, it's not like um, when you um, see someone say something disgusting on the internet and you have to figure out right then, how am I going to respond? And that usually ends up just being um, kind of a stupid exercise in, you know, building your own um, public sense of righteousness mm. um, and, and, does, and doesn't usually change the person's mind. Um, but um, as a actual friend, he's asking about a friend here, <laughs> um, as an actual friend, um, you can over time 
um, introduce different ways of thinking. Like he could, um, he, you know, he can send him um, polite little links to articles that, that he that he might want to consider. Um, he can make um, he can make jokes about some of the way some of these stereotypes that the guy has about women. Like this is something like, you know, these th these things are. Um, yeah, everybody sees other human beings sometimes in sexualized ways, but these are extremely ridiculous, boring <laughs> stereotypes. Asian Slavic dragon Natasha. lady. Yeah, wow. Are like, like, like no human is really like this. Like, how is? How you are know? you real? Yeah, exactly. So you know, so so I think this is something that is best handled with humor and um, and a a um, sort of a sort of slow introduction to why this might not be the best way of thinking. And, and you know. And I think he, sh I, I think he should also, um, you know, it's it sounds like he's um, might be going easy on the friends racism. You know, he asked how should I handle his way of thinking about women, um, but the guy's way of thinking about women is so absurd that it seems um, rather easily joked about in some ways. Right. But um, but the um, the junk racial science, like, I mean, I can see where as a person of color, maybe he just wants to completely avoid that topic. But I think he should include that in his general um, slow walk campaign toward um, a, a um, um, t toward other ways of thinking. Yeah, more power to him. I mean, yeah. I find that kind of interaction very difficult. Mm -hmm. Like when we go to our friend's parents' farm in rural Rhode Island Oof. and her dad just has on Fox News 24-7. And like, I, it, I know it bothers our friend and she's always trying to talk to them about politics and like props to her for that. But I just, I find it so difficult. I usually just avoid the topic with, I mean, not just with her family, with my own family as well. I mean, my family's yeah. not Trump supporters, but they definitely don't share my politics. And it's just, uh, you know what they say, you should never talk about politics or religion. It's just so much easier not to do it. But they're yeah. such fun topics. I know. I know. <laughs> That's like most of what we talk about here at it, the Antifada. It, yeah. Politics, yeah. religion, and sex. I mean, what else do you want to talk about? <laughs> they are wonderful things. But uh, yeah, I agree. You know, having a lot of uh, conservatives in my family uh, as well, a lot of Archie Bunker types. Um, I find it best to avoid uh, these discussions, and Jamie actually has given me props on how uh, I've been able to, you know, deal with some of the things. You in my are family, really good so. at talking to people. I'm jealous. I don't think you give yourself enough credit. Um, like, I don't know. It's a skill. It's a special skill that you have well, to talk to people of all different persuasions. I mean, hey, not for nothing. I was not a leftist when we first met. Mm. It feels very anti, a very unfeminist of me to admit that. But like. It's true. And, you know, best case scenario, partners can influence each they, other they in really hopefully do. positive yeah. ways. Yeah. So, like, when we first met, I would ask you stupid questions like, no, you call yourself much. a communist and yet you use money. What's up with that? <laughs> All right, that is kind of stupid. But, you know, and you that's a classic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like he uses an iPhone, too. Right. You know? yeah. Yeah. That, it was a big Occupy Wall Street thing. These kids are all filming <laughs> on their iPhones. Where do you think it came from? <laughs> Capitalism. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he would like... They obviously haven't read their marks. Right? <laughs> and he, but he would give Where me he like... specifically <laughs> says that you must never use an iPhone. <laughs> but he he was very forward like, thinking. In yeah. that. He would give me nice answers, you know? He wouldn't talk down to me. He would definitely not mansplain to me um part of it is probably because he liked me but mm -hmm. it That's was true. it was very effective in the end well i, I got curious i got curious yeah. left curious and left finally curious. <laughs> here i am well i i think i mean i don't i i appreciate your your compliments on that i think for me as i you know i said before like coming from a family that was very much you know, an Archie Bunker type uh, Reagan Democrat, uh, working class, uh, white Queens family, uh, especially on the one side of my family. Um, these were the sorts of things that, you know, I kind of grew up with dealing with uh, mm -hmm. some very, mm -hmm. as they say, problematic uh, comments. Mm -hmm. And also too now uh, being in the construction, uh, people don't dance around uh, topics perhaps uh, like they do in other workplaces. Uh, issues mm -hmm. of race and gender uh, are very much up front. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, obviously because it's a very diverse industry, mm -hmm. you have a lot of um, a lot of joking and a lot of teasing about racial stuff that, mm -hmm. you know, if, if 
um, SJW types from the university, they came onto the job site and they heard some of the shit that the, the white workers are saying to the black workers and the black workers are saying to the white people and the Spanish and so on and so forth. They'd be appalled by it. But one of the ways that difference is confronted uh, on the job, and I'm not talking political difference, I'm talking yeah. cultural or ethnic yeah, yeah. difference, is by actually uh, being very open about it and like breaking balls. You know, like mm -hmm. the black guy will be like, ah, oh, what do you know? You know, you're a white guy with a tiny dick, you don't know anything. And then, <laughs> you know, like throwing these sort of things around, but it's a way of, uh, you know, kind of diffusing, you know, these issues. Well, these my, my first wife worked in an all woman physical therapy practice, and they all hated each other. But they were all uh, wouldn't admit it, and so they were all very polite to each other. And then they would talk behind each other's back, and I was like, "Wow, that is such a different like an all male environment. Yeah. Like uh, it would all be in the surface, right? Uh, not that that's necessarily entirely better, but there is something to be said for getting stuff out in the open rather than like letting oh, yeah. it fester mm -hmm. and it's, being dishonest about your feelings. It's yeah, not it's, good. It's it's not uh, you know I, I'm I'm giving the best shine on it I possibly could because it's a lot of like crude stereotypical. Sure ball breaking humor and then of course there's like the real racism that exists especially among uh my uh fellow white guys from long island especially but um yeah you know if you want to uh give the best shine on it, shine on it i would say exactly that that it gets it out into the open it doesn't avoid it um but it turns it into you know joke something humorous and if there's any way, and I've done this a little bit on the job before, that I can do a bit what you were talking about, Liza, in terms of slow walking people, you know, humor is also a way to do that and try to bring people away from some of their more racial or gender. How uh, often does one guy call another a faggot? Uh, it happens pretty often, but I think more, even more often, uh, there's uh, a lot of like um, uh, homosocial, uh, like, um, gay joking with each mm -hmm. other like oh you're looking good today i'll take you in the shanty and i'll, and I'll oh, give wow. it to you, you <laughs> this know, is that's... progress from 20 years ago. yeah 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 <laughs> yes, uh, definitely better. It, it's uh it, i mean a lot, it's it's weird too i don't know how generalizable it is because it's also new york city which i think even you know the traditional quote-unquote working class um is in a different kind of environment a mm -hmm. relatively more progressive mm -hmm. environment but yeah it's more you know joking about you know like Oh, uh, you're coming back home with me tonight. I'll show you a good time. Or, oh, you brought your knee pads to work. Oh, good. You're going to keep your job today. You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> That's funny. One of the, thi one of the things I appreciate, you're, what you're saying reminds me that one of the other things I appreciate about this letter is, um, I mean, he, he's, he, he sounds like he has a good sense of, um, of how to use his own, um, his, his own position and his own, um, status and the way he comes across. I like his long identification of himself as a vanilla non-revolutionary <laughs> cis male person of color. It's like, well, that's quite a mouthful. Um, but, uh, um, but, it's, um, but it's like he seems to get that because he comes across as a bit of a normie, his friend might listen to him a little bit more than he would listen to some you know, some random crazy feminist on the internet like me or something. You yeah, know? I mean, that's the people it, it, whose job it is, really. If it's yeah, anyone's job. Yeah, exactly. So he's he's kind of stepping up to the end. I appreciate it, much as you do on your job, because you probably don't come across as a... Um, as a crazy, you know, gay communist. I don't come across that way, no. <laughs> not I know. Mean, no one would know. Yeah. <laughs> not, <laughs> so. Certainly not outside the shanty. You got to get to know him a little bit first. That shanty sounds like a hot center, though. Oh, I tell you, <laughs> I man, when that red light's on. <laughs> you, you guys should definitely make that porno. <laughs> <laughs> the shanty. <laughs> the shanty. Oh, wow. <laughs> Change your minds one butt at a time. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Uh, we use tools all day at work. I mean, we go. We go. It's very. It ways. sounds <laughs> very erotic. Like I'm a little bit sad that I don't get to be in this space because it sounds very, uh, very interesting it's and one uh, of the village people. It's one more. Side I was of just thinking of the village people. It's really yeah, the village people video. That's like. right. Yeah. I mean, uh, I can maybe convince the guys at work to put a band together. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to just be village people, all construction workers. I'm uh, fascinated by these all male spaces. They're just like so foreign to me. Yeah. Like even something as simple as like, how can you guys just like pull your dick out and pee in front of a stranger? That is so weird to me. 
Yeah. It's male privilege. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and like guys don't care at all if you walk in on them peeing. Like they never lock the fucking door. Like I was at a show the other night at this mm. club elsewhere and they have gender neutral bathrooms, which is great. Mm-hmm. But like guys do not lock the door at all. So that it like you push on the door and you're like, oh, I'm sorry. And they're like, they like don't even turn around. Like yeah. they don't give a shit. Well, you know, there's a famous story about uh, LBJ. Uh, oh, God. In the Capitol. He was uh, taking a piss one day in the Capitol men's room and somebody he wanted to talk to came in and he just turned around. Well, and he continued to piss on the floor what? and started talking to this Wow. Guy. <laughs> Apparently, that's Johnson a had a move. giant hog, too. So yeah. it was probably, it was a, that's a power move right there. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Really like, is. is that strange to you, Liza? Uh, oh, that um, th- that that LBJ, the president of the no, United States, like would be pissing men, on somebody. Well, the, yeah. men in general. I mean, it's yeah. less strange the LBJ thing because yeah. like he's clearly a psychopath. Yeah, that's that's true. No, it is it is strange, and it's I, one of the cool things about gender neutral bathrooms is that we're all going to be getting to know each other's habits a lot better. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. civilized men. Yeah. Yeah. Like I walk in on them and I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like I didn't ma- mean to make you feel unsafe, and they're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Men's bathrooms are not safe spaces. They're no, certainly. apparently. Apparently not. Yeah, this is a lot of good, interesting stuff. Uh, this this masculinity, this vulgarity. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we're going to talk more about that a little bit later. But um, A rich topic. Yes, indeed. for sure. Indeed. But for now, I was thinking we could play a little bit of sound from the news. The news? The news that's been going on? The, the goddamn news. The, this is uh, unprecedented. <laughs> the goddamn uh, news. <laughs> because uh, the Antifada uh, has been in its soft launch fa- uh, phase, we've actually managed to not talk about the news at all. And we haven't, until this episode, even said the motherfucking T word, mm-hmm. Trump. Ooh. We have not even fucking mentioned the guy. So now we, uh, you know, we got a whole new world op- to open up. You know... Every every good thing has to come to an end sometime. Yeah, I know. It was nice not we having cannot, to talk about that. We can no longer live in our I little coastal <laughs> bubble, <laughs> not even thinking about the horrible shit that's going on in Washington. Badly. Nu- so. Nukes don't care about your bubble. It's our, you know, it's our, our elite bubble, but he comes from just the other side of Newtown Creek, right? That, that, is, that is not, not good wrong. point. So um, as you guys p- probably saw... Trump launched some airstrikes in Syria. Yes. And I actually haven't seen too much commentary on it yet. Maybe I'm just bad at finding these clips on the internet. But like, I remember a year ago when it happened, the media, the whole media was suddenly just horny for war. Mm-hmm. Like, That's how it Ooh, is. This now. is the moment Donald uh, Trump yeah. became president. Yeah. Um, is that happening now? They're doing some of that now. Absolutely. Well, all right. Well, let's watch a little bit of this and then you guys can go off. Oh, God. Fellow Americans. A short time ago, I ordered the United States Armed Forces to launch precision strikes on targets associated with the chemical weapons capabilities of Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad. The combined operation with the armed forces of France and the United Kingdom is now underway. We thank them both. Tonight, I want to speak with you about why we have taken this action. One year ago, Assad launched a savage chemical oh, weapons there goes the attack. Hand. He loves to do that against yeah, his yeah. own he goes innocent from, like, people. An OK sign to like the United States yeah. responded the Pepe with, sign. with 58 yeah. missile <laughs> strikes that right destroyed thing. 20% of the Syrian air force. He's Last so Saturday, upset that he can't talk about like crowd sizes of his rallies right now. Yeah. He hates that he has to do this Just telephone. Slaughter. So he has to show us a small hand. This time, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> in the town of Doma, Doma, near the Syrian capital of Damascus. This massacre was a significant escalation oh, in a pattern of chemical weapons use by that very terrible regime. The evil... And the despicable attack writers left mothers and fathers, in infants oh, and no. children. Oh, he'd stumble over it. Just yeah. wrong. It would be implausible. And it's like a talking dog or something. Yeah. These are not the actions of a man. They are crimes of a monster instead. Oh. Following the Climbing horrors monster. of World War I a century ago, civilized nations joined together to ban chemical warfare. Chemical weapons are uniquely dangerous, not only because they inflict gruesome suffering, 
but because was that even small Boab amounts can they, unleash yeah, mother of all, widespread mother of all devastation. Yeah, they did that just for symbolic reasons yeah. to show that we the have The purpose that. of our actions Incidentally, tonight. my great-grandfather... Are you, guys, are you guys sick of this yet? Can I turn oh, it off? Oh, I was thinking about the it's, second. It's, it's unbearable. It, it, it's, it's literally <laughs> And I'm no fan of Comey, but pointing out his orange face and the, the white blotches yes. where he puts the tanning goggles... It's like so not see that raccoon anymore. eyes. Yeah. Like for someone who's so obsessed with his image, you'd think he would have done something about that by now. Well, you know, his tie is too long. His hair is weird. But also probably his ass is too fat. Everyone's <laughs> too. Everyone right around him is too afraid of him to say anything. He's like uh, Gavin Belson on Silicon Valley. You know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Good reference. Yeah. Good, show. Yeah. Yes, good reference. Yeah. That's one of the few TV shows yeah, we actually watch. Yeah, it's oh. one of the few references it's a good we would one. actually. It understand. is so good. <laughs> anything that sends up tech, uh, tech world, yeah, yeah. Is, is really really good. Incidentally, my great grandfather, who I was fortunate enough to know because to know because he lived to be 103 years old, was. Uh, gassed in world war one oh my god uh, and survived got what? a uh, purple heart from it wow. um so i'm no stranger to chemical weapons um i think you know there's a lot of angles to take this serious thing from i think personally i would say that um obviously anytime america goes out and and attacks people and blows shit up uh it sucks and we do it a lot uh, for me, when I first heard about it, when I woke up, I believe it was Saturday, so a day or so ago, um, I just had this feeling of hopelessness and helplessness because mm -hmm. in this particular instance, there's no anti-war movement right now. There's right. not any political leverage. You know, the, right. everything's so chaotic right now. There's just absolutely nothing that, that it seems like we could do right now to stop things from escalating even further, God forbid, uh, into some sort of... Uh, all-out war or semi-war with Iran or Russia. But now you have something like Democrats and you know, pun the pundit class in general saying he didn't do enough. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, oh God, what, I guess just... Are what, they, what are they, they saying do? that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah That's yeah, yeah. insane. Yeah. There's no strategy. Uh, it was just a pinprick. You know, he's going out and do it again. Uh, it's, not, it's not going to be effective. You're really going to really tell enough, Trump he needs a bigger button? Come on, guys. Right. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. It's amazing. Well, I mean, yeah. uh, we're, we're at the, the point where the Secretary of Defense, Mattis, nicknamed Mad Dog, <laughs> yeah. is a restraining force oh on Trump's God. worst instincts. And It's uh, like Curtis LeMay being like, stop, hold on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Strangelove shit. And, and I mean, and the and the Democrats would have done something very similar, if not worse. So well, that's a great point. Yeah. So there's no opposition party to this um, act of aggression on Syria, and um, and uh, and then on top of that, um, the the left left is very divided about it too, and 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 is and there's a lot of um, the, and the, and there's a lot of. Um, you know, fighting um, uh, uh, among, among leftists about it. And what I find so ridiculous about that is exactly what you just um, said, Sean. Um, what, what are the stakes of this discussion for American leftists? When we have no power, as an, we have no organized anti-war movement, um, what people are essentially fighting about is what should your position be? Right. That is literally the most unimportant political argument you could have. Yes. But well, if you're on Twitter, is, it's very is important. What should yeah. your position yeah. be? Well, we can like, organize around those positions. You can, but nobody is proposing to do that. Right. You know, like and what position should we organize around is a fair it, question. It's a fair question, but we are so far from that question. People are doing a lot of organizing, but on completely different things. And, and, so, and we are so far from from currently um, having any kind of organ organizational capacity that could make a difference on a foreign policy issue that, I, I mean, I, I, um, I know this is almost kind of anti-intellectual, but I literally, when I see people arguing about it, I think, why I don't even understand why people are arguing about this. Well, like, something we could organize around is a lot of the weapons that are in Syria come either directly from the United States or indirectly or from our allies like the Saudis. Right. Like, so if we stop flooding the country with weapons and white fighters, yeah. it's like, you know, repeating the problem of Afghanistan. Like we come up with these uh, allies of convenience that may have served in some imperial aim at the moment and then just escalate to such mushrooming brutality yeah. as a result of it. 
But, uh, you know, uh, we're not hearing anything about what Saudi Arabia is doing in Yemen. Oh, no. You know, no. That's all. Oh, in Myanmar, there's, uh, I think the UN's close to calling genocide what's happening to Muslims in Myanmar right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you don't hear a peep about that whatsoever. Yeah. Um, I, I think people are a little bit confused yeah. what their position should be because it is well, very complicated. Well, it's a big damn mess. There's it's, no simple good guy and bad guy. you're not a Middle East specialist or even Absolutely. if you are. I mean, I as a leftist, I'm very concerned about the people in Rojava sure. who are nice. organizing around this socialist experiment there. And Definitely. I feel a lot of solidarity for them. I feel a lot of concern towards Definitely. them. I think the Obama administration actually got it pretty right when they supported the Kurds in Rojava with yeah. a mm. limited number of airstrikes. Yeah. But mm. against, mainly because they were fighting ISIS, like I don't yeah. have any mm. doubt that the U.S. will eventually pull out and let Turkey come in and kill everyone. Oh, it's yeah. completely but, opportunistic. Yeah. Yeah. But I do not trust Trump to do anything right in that area. But you had CIA proxy forces fighting Pentagon proxy forces. <laughs> yeah. <like this>. <laughs> Insane. <laughs> it was yeah. the whole thing. Like, as you said, it's not only, you know, no, Jamie, you said, you know, if you're a Middle East expert, I think uh, it was an Andrew Coburn who's over there. Uh, is it Andrew or the other Coburn? Patrick. Patrick, Patrick Coburn, thank yeah. you, who's over there. And even he, you know, when you see him talk or write pieces, cautions about making any strong assessments on what's happening because it's so fucking complicated. Nobody yeah. knows. There Nobody are no knows. reporters or anything and on the scene. People can't get in there. People can't get it's in. It's hard and, to get accurate But everybody speaks with great certainty about what's going on. Well, I, I would make two points. And the first one that branches off of what Liza said about um, all we can really do is kind of try to score points. And, yeah. you know, I'll use the, the, so the right wing term, which actually I, I kind of like a little bit. It's similar to like the word cock. Uh, sorry that I had to use that word on air. But uh, virtue signaling is something yes, that the right talks about. Signaling. And it's actually it's a, a thing. thing. It's a real thing. And what it is reminds it still a signal if you do it with weapons. Well, no, that's I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about um, the strike as, as that. Uh, that's uh, symbolic, but actually deadly as well. And people died in it. What I'm talking about is this tendency that we we're talking about uh, to have to take some stand on it. And it reminds me very much of um, what you see on uh, Facebook or Twitter uh, or Tanky Book especially, right? Uh, this whole national liberation left uh, anti-imperialism, which is often very shallow, uh, these people who try to force you into, posi into a position to, to say, well, you must support Assad or you support U.S. imperialism. Right. Well, like, mm -hmm. first off, no. And second off, like, what does it mean to support? Right. Are you sending him fucking weapons? Are you sending yeah. him money? Or are you writing a fucking post on Facebook? I'm or, tweeting passionately. Yeah. Right, yeah. It means <laughs> or, absolutely fucking nothing. Or, or the counterparts to those people, which are just, to me, the reverse of the same thing, uh, who, who, are, who are like, well, if you don't support the Syrian people against Assad... You know, I mean, it's like, again, what does that mean? Like, sh I mean, like, w what would be the material consequences of my support or 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 more vague still my solidarity? Right. You yeah. know, it's like, I mean, <laughs> making it, you feel it, better. I, it, think I mean, it, it it's all about the like, it's all about the affect. Yeah. I, I it's find American it, Protestantism. The act of witnessing is what's important. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Can I get a witness. It, it, that's right. And 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 I, I really um yeah, no, I, I, I find it really um, um, a, um, a, a completely um, ridiculous and unself-aware discursive situation. Well, one thing we can argue for, certainly, is taking in more refugees. Oh, no yeah, question. that's exactly yeah. what I was yeah. going to say, yeah. No question. Which was Absolutely. A, like uh, what I was going to, uh, my second point, which you exactly hit on, was remember all that talk about... Um, you know, Trump ran on not letting these terrorist Syrian refugees in now, and he's fucking crying over uh, these now these same Syrians getting right. fucking you know killed but with chemical weapons in, in Syria. Like, which is it? Are they all terrorists, or are we supposed to like you know retaliate in defense of them? You know, they should just stay in their shithole countries. And, and yeah. okay, but but not but only get barrel bomb, not chemical gassed. Is yeah, the, the, yeah, the thing about chemical weapons is a little weird, too. It's like, okay, to cluster bomb or carpet bomb or cruise missile bomb or whatever. But you Yeah, know, do people gas. think that those things are nice and gentle? Right. You, you, right. Could argue, you could argue that there's like a slippery slope that chemical weapons use is going to be normalized. But this is such a serious, such a unique situation. Do we really see like... 
oh, if we let Syria kill its own citizens with chemical weapons, that's going to start a precedence it's where Macron is going to kill them with bombs. Where Macron is going to start, you know, <laughs> dropping mustard gas on striking railway workers. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't, you I don't never get know. The... <laughs> yeah, we're just going to make bombs out of our love and send those over there. Instead. Bomb with love. Yeah. Love Trump's create, hate. Yeah. Just some sort of woke liberal airstrike situation. I, I do think, in fairness um, to the American left, um, the um, the the people who go over and join the YPG, um, the fighters that Jamie mentioned um, fighting ISIS and for democratic socialism, I, I think that's amazing. Yeah, and that, there are ways that we can materially support them. Yeah, I I yeah. might I'm gonna tr do a little digging. That would be really good to let people know, I think. Yeah. Because I, I, I think that's like we are so lacking in practical ways to respond to this horrifying humanitarian situation. And um, and it would be really good to let people know. Mm. Perhaps yeah, we totally. can look it up and put that in the show notes. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, it's, it's quite sad that there's not really much that we can do materially to support things in Syria. But um, some things we can do closer to home uh, are uh, examine... Vote the... for Democrats. <laughs> yes, vote for <laughs> oh, Democrats. Yeah, That's definitely the Antifada mindset. No, uh, drag on Democrats is more like it. Um, there's a uh, gubernatorial uh, primary happening now. Our uh, illustrious and wonderful... Uh, not nepotistically elected governor uh, Andrew Cuomo uh, has a challenger. Uh, her name is, I just found out about her, you know, a week or so ago. Her name's Cynthia Nixon. How and did you just find out about I just, her? I'm just out of the fucking room. This is a very gendered division it's, of knowledge, I feel. I, know. I knew who she was. Yeah. Like, well, we, we talked about it. Yeah, we talked about it earlier, and Liza goes, You don't know about Miranda? Uh, <laughs> what, was, what, what years were, were the show on? I don't know, 90s, Late early 90s, 2000s. Late 90s, early 2000s, right? Yeah, All right, well, I was one of those obnoxious people that would be like, I don't have a television. <laughs> I don't have TV. It was really cute. Like, don't do that. I don't watch TV. This is you must listen to NPR, though. I just listen to NPR. <laughs> <laughs> not to go too far off track, but it's really funny that Sam was in an episode of Sex in the City with her, and we played the clip on the show the other day. It's the one where she's in L.A., and she meets up with her friend, who and like lost a bunch of weight and he like loves LA and that's Sam mm -hmm. and then he won't swallow his steak when they go to dinner. Oh, that's him. Yes, that's... every single woman we've told that to has been like, "Oh, <laughs> Sam was that guy," and yes. every single man has come up totally blank. That's so. Funny. I come up blank. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not prepared for this gubernatorial primary. I've never <laughs> seen that episode before. Like he said that to we had Nobiki Konst on the Majority Report the other day, mm -hmm. and he told her, or I think I might have even butted, butted in and mentioned it. She's like, "That was you," <laughs> and it was really cute. <laughs> That's funny. That is, that is funny. So let's see some of uh, some of what Cynthia Nixon stands for as this uh, kind of stalking horse uh, progressive candidate. Hi, I'm Cynthia Nixon. A lot of you have been asking about my position on marijuana. She's very so happy and chirpy. Mm -hmm. I believe it's time for New York to follow nice, the lead uh, of eight Ikea other states couch. and DC yeah. and legalize recreational marijuana. Hell yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of good reasons for legalizing marijuana. Think we're but for me, it comes that. down to this. We have to stop putting people of color in jail Fuck yeah. for something that white people do with impunity. Great take. 80% of the New Yorkers who are arrested for marijuana are black or Latino, despite the fact that whites and people of color use marijuana at roughly the same rates. The consequences follow people for the rest of their lives, making it harder to get jobs or housing and for non-citizens, putting them in the crosshairs for deportation. Also very topical in Trump's In addition election. to ending a key front in the racist war on drugs, regulating and taxing marijuana would generate hundreds of millions of dollars of tax revenue for our people yes. and create important agricultural opportunities for our Get state. that upstate yes. vote. Get that upstate in vote. Throw that weed. In a blue state like New York, marijuana or shouldn't even be an issue. Oh. If there was more political courage coming out of Albany, we would have done this already. A lot comes out of all The simple Albany, truth is, for courageous. white people, the use of marijuana has effectively been legal for a long time. True. Isn't it time we legalize it for everybody else? Damn straight. So I love everything about that um, clip because 
um, she 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 manages to explain um, why it's a racial justice issue and how it's an issue of economic g growth and opportunity and could create jobs um, implicitly, as you were suggesting, for um, upstate. And she uses the word recreational, which is sort of just broadly realistic about how most people use it <laughs> and, yeah. and also a bit of um, pro-pleasure politics that we could really yeah. use in the yes. mainstream and is usually missing. We need yeah. recreation right we now need. of all kinds. <laughs> yes. The American people need to have some fun. Damn <laughs> straight. Know, yeah. I saw a cop quoted recently that saying one of the reasons he opposes legalization is, is that the scent of marijuana gives you a pretext to search a car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they really, they really it's, to them, it's a gateway drug, a gateway to busting. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's and, a gateway to harassment. Yeah. yeah. And, like right. she's, it's Stop an excuse to her. harass minorities for one more reason, mm -hmm. like she said. Mm -hmm. I mean, like similar to what she said, you know, if you walk down, we all of us, right? We live in New York City. You walk down the street. I mean, how often are you walking down the street and it's just somebody smoking a joint? Maybe you don't see it, but you smell it halfway. Oh, it's up all the over block. our neighborhood. It's just all over the, the place. Yeah. I, I I'm working in Manhattan at the moment, and you go out and people like on their you know lunch breaks or whatever, office workers just like sharing you know mm -hmm. a, a joint or a bowl or whatever. This is why productivity street. isn't. You know, productivity statistics are so weak. <laughs> you it's, found the magic bullet. It's fucking humiliating that we don't have legal marijuana in New York no, yet. No, it's really embarrassing. Yeah. And all these square states like Colorado. Like, you know. square. Literally square. Yeah. And Literally. figuratively. Yeah. Yes. Square in every sense. But, you know, John Denver did right. Rocky Mountain High. Oh, Pass right. the pipe around. Right. And they've got that libertarian uh, streak about them. They, too, yes, uh, they do. They've been hippies a long time. So and like yeah, sometimes, to be fair, mm -hmm. sometimes when we're talking about progressive legislation in New York, upstate is the problem. But in this instance, it really wouldn't be. No way. Because there's yeah. left liberals and libertarians, and they all think weed should be legal. And they all smoke weed. And this is why this is a very smart issue for yeah, her. It's very much yeah. a cross class yeah. issue. Yeah. It is, yeah. And cross race issue. Yeah. But our dumb governor says, you know, it's it's a gateway drug. Well, yeah. let's, let's talk about that dumb governor. I don't think, uh, you know, talk about purity of hate. I don't think there's any lack for hate of uh, Andrew Cuomo in uh, this room. Is that fair to say? That is, that fair. is yeah. fair. That is a fair uh, characterization. For our national and uh, hopefully international audience, does anybody want to jump in and just talk about who the fuck this Cuomo character is and how he's been in power for two terms and is now running for a third? Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, um, well, as a he just said um, Doug, as a um, as I mean, since you, I think you you might um, have a leg up on all of us because. You have been hating the whole Cuomo oh, I hated family his father too. for <laughs> decades longer than now, any of us. The cult around his father, Mario Cuomo, my was unbearable. My family worshipped. I remember as a kid when he was the governor, my, they worshipped at the altar. My liberal parents worshipped at the altar of Mario Cuomo. Yeah, he was uh, I'd icon. say one principal thing he did was he was against capital punishment, and he did that at considerable political risk in an earlier time when it was much riskier than it would be now. And even now it would not be an easy thing to do. So I'll cr grant him that. But... Uh, no, I, when he was running for re-election, I called his press office and asked, "What, what, what's your, what achievements are you proudest of?" Uh, the first governor Cuomo term, and he said, "Lowering the top tax rate." That was what he listed wow. first. So he's really, under all his liberal moralism and high-mindedness, he was really basically the tool of Wall Street, and wow. uh, his son is even more so. I mean, his son has been a very Wall Street friendly. He came into office saying he wanted to like break union power in the state um, right. and uh, he's been a big promoter of you know educational um, experiments meaning charter schools and all that crap uh, and to, to hear all these unions racing to endorse him as a friend of the working class is utterly surreal uh, you know the problem is you know in the case of the state uh, workers uh, he signs their paychecks so they're, they really have don't have much choice but to go along with him uh, which you know is a constraint on union politics but uh, uh, he's certainly not a friend of the working class and yeah. they've gotten particular gains from him I mean each of the unions that is backing him has gotten something from him you know so they're not I mean they're, they're not directly opposing um, their members interests but they're also not really thinking about the larger context uh, which is that um, he um, he he totally protects 
the Republicans in um, in Albany. Like he does not advance the cause of even liberal Democrats. He does not help um, more Democrats to get elected. He actively stands in the way, and um, and he and he um, he really protects the um, the IDC, the independent Democrats. Who, um, who who consistently caucus with Republicans and block every opportunity for any kind of progressive reform. So that is so at odds with the majority um, of the working class and with all the people that those unions represent. But they're uh, I think that they're uh, that they're looking at this in a very narrow way and 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 being like, well, we got this particular thing from him. We got the we got the fifteen dollars an hour, or we got something in particular. Yeah, and my know? my union, I remember going to a rally and, and uh, getting uh, picket duty uh, credit for it uh, up in Albany. And <laughs> this is another running theme. I think Cuomo, in order to fuck de Blasio and de Blasio's yes. affordable housing plan, backed the building trades unions who were essentially 401A, 402A, there was some legislation that came up. Long story short is that Cuomo threw the building trades a bone because it was around election time. I think Obviously, you know, he's not been, as we say, a friend of the, the working man. But let's continue with this thread, Jamie, because I think you found some great, a great story regarding the Working Families Party and Cynthia Nixon and uh, some problematic quotes uh, regarding uh, union workers. One thing that's been happening with Cynthia Nixon and the unions is that um, the unions have been pulling out of the Working Families Party because yes. it looks like the Working Families Party is going to endorse her against Cuomo. Well, they did. And, yeah. Oh, they did. Oh, they did today? Yeah. Was oh. it, or yesterday? Last night. Nice. Last night. Okay. And the unions did not want to be uh, held responsible for that because right. they still think that Cuomo's going to win and they don't want to be punished after the fact. And he's a vindictive motherfucker. Oh, yes. fuck yeah, yeah, yeah no, their, their fears are probably justified in, in, in the sense that he will take revenge. I think it was similar yeah. to Clinton, Bernie, and the unions, right? Yeah, the, yeah they're hedging their bets because they knew, yeah. like just with Bernie, like with Bernie, they knew that he was going to be good to them no matter what. Yeah. But they knew that Clinton would punish them <laughs> if they crossed her and they thought she was probably going to win. So yes. really, it, you can't blame them too hard for that. Oh, yeah. They're looking out for their narrow self-interest. Yeah, as we yeah, mentioned, yeah. Right? Absolutely. But um, mm -hmm. she also did make a gaffe yes. that pissed off a lot of the union people. Pissed me off when I read it. Which is fair. Which is weird because her wife is a union official, right? Yeah, and she's also she's been a SAG member for 25 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a little different from being a TWU uh, transit worker. But, yeah. but she yeah. also seemed to like blame... Bus drivers and subway conductors yeah, for the cost yeah. of yeah. Uh, construction. Well, that's so, the, that weird. the quote. So here's yeah, what she said. Yeah, yeah. She said, the unions have to understand with the deals that they have now, you can't hope to make improvements to the trains in a fiscally responsible way. Everybody's got to pull together and everybody's got to make sacrifices. Ooh, whenever politicians yeah, start no, saying no, sacrifices. No. Yeah, that's bad news. That, it's, it's bad. that sounds Clinton-esque, really. Yeah, it does, no, right? I did not like that at yeah, all. Yeah, that's some neoliberal shit. Well, so we, then she issued a mea culpa after some pushback where she said, I am and have been a proud union member for 40 years. My wife, Christine, was a union organizer. I opposed Governor Cuomo's file attacks against teachers and public sector unions during his first term. I always have and always will stand with working families and my union brothers and sisters. Do we, do she we is believe a novice, her? You know, she's not new. That's, she's not a practiced liar the way most politicians are. That's a very generous way to put it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think personally, I, in my mind, the novice factor of it, right, I think is big. But uh, my take on, on Cynthia Nixon, and I don't want to, to make a very strong uh, pat analogy here, but what concerns me is it reminds me of when um, a relatively unknown guy named Bill de Blasio uh, mm -hmm. ran against not an incumbent, but somebody with a lot of political power named Christine Quinn mm -hmm. uh, for the mayorship, uh, what was it, six, seven years ago. De Blasio is seen as this breath of fresh air. Quinn is seen as being an ally to Bloomberg and being, you know, an insider's insider. And so Nixon is, again, this political neophyte with these really great progressive ideas like de Blasio also had, mm -hmm. right? Uh, populist uh, railing against, you know, the rich and things of this sort. Social justice things like, uh, obviously, the racial aspects of, uh, you know, marijuana and mm -hmm. 
uh, enforcement and, and everything like that. But my my concern is a that Cynthia Nixon's gaffe on the transit workers union stuff is actually where she the kind of progressivism that she is coming from. Uh, could, yeah. Upper West Side sort of. Um, I mean, she is a. Hey, rich, I lived there for is, thirty she, years. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she is a rich Hollywood celebrity. Yes, yeah. right. Like, That's why I don't think it's yeah. a gap. But, it might not be. But then the other thing too is that you know Andrew Cuomo, and uh, this is what makes him horrible, but it also makes the reason why he has so much power is that he knows how to work the machine, yeah. right? Qu uh, Christine Quinn knew how to work the machine. Mm -hmm. Cynthia Nixon, all right, she could have the most progressive values in the entire world. She could run the best campaign, you know, pull all the unions on board, all these progressive groups. But if she goes up to Albany, right, without a dramatic change up there, they're going to eat her lunch. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that machine, the, the not just the corruption, but just how entrenched those, those interests are. Uh, up there and how brutal and backstabbing it is. I'm not saying this because she's a woman. I'm saying that any person who is a political neophyte going into the hellhole that's fucking Albany mm -hmm. is going to get absolutely fucking obliterated yeah. up there. They're literally yeah. going to take her PB&J or her sashimi or whatever and eat it right in front of her. <laughs> <laughs> They'll Make be her watch. Her upside down and taking her uh, lunch money. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I... I have limited enthusiasm for her as a candidate, but I do love the way in which she's causing Cuomo pain. Oh, oh definitely. Yeah. I think Anything to make the, that guy suffer is good. You know? That's the beautiful thing. And, um, and you know, whenever he is, um, and whenever he's in pain and um, writhing with hate, something good comes out of it. You know, like he gets, when he, when he gets really threatened, he usually does. He makes some concession to that's, the left. That's, that's yeah. true. You know, and and so and like his whole his his whole fight with De Blasio. It's like it. You know, it's been childish and stupid, but actually, we the people have gotten a lot out of it. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> true. You know, I mean, and um, and I think that this will be kind of similar. Like he's already being like. I might be evolving on marijuana. <laughs> it's like, well, that was quick. Uh, you know? So I think, uh, I, I think we'll certainly see some good coming out of it. What I, I hope that it doesn't, um, I, I do hope that the Cynthia Nixon campaign um, gives um, a lot of, um, of momentum and attention to the um, to the general effort to run better grassroots candidates and get more good people into Albany because I think that's a really exciting um, development locally. I realize that's less exciting for people nationally, but it is exciting for um, people here in New York. And I would hate to see the c celebrity of her um, campaign, which is not she is not going to win. And I would hate to see the celebrity of her campaign distract. Um, from the, um, the the smaller local campaigns that are, I think, re really a lot more important. However, if it just and only it, the half, sorry, only half the population's heard of her anyway. So like, yeah, yeah. not yeah. that famous. She's also running twenty. Only women percent. have heard of her. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's it's a very true. gendered thing. It's true, but it's an. I mean, women are a pretty important and large group of, of voters. Um, but um, yeah, I so so, so I, I hope it just gives more momentum to the left rather than um, rather than just becoming this um, well it might help the challenges to those IDC guys who you know caucus with the Republicans too that's right. what I was there hoping. are a bunch of challengers against them and Cuomo was caught the other night uh, um, secretly attending a fundraiser for them so he had publicly like, like wow. folded them into the Democrat uh, Democratic coalition but privately he's promoting them because he wants a Republican controlled Senate because he doesn't want them passing any progressive legislation because he wants to run in 2020 as somebody who tried to get something done in Albany got blocked by the Republicans, but there's a good progressive, so vote for I guess Cuomo Booker or Cuomo Zuckerberg 2020, whatever the case may be. Well, His also, whole, it's all been in a, a presidential run since he started politics. I he, mean, yeah, you yeah. need a ton of money to run for president, and he doesn't want to piss off his friends with money exactly. in this state, basically. Exactly. So yeah, he true. wants to be able to continue to have his pro one percenter policies, and um, and you know doing anything um, bad to the IDC would be counterproductive to that. Yeah, he'd hate he'd have to hate to have to veto a tax the rich bill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you know tax the rich bill got through the assembly, um, then he would uh, be in an embarrassing position of having to veto it, and he doesn't want to do that. So if he's got these Republicans controlling the Senate, doesn't have to. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're we're skeptical here at the Antifada of electoral politics as a route a route to change. But if we do want to change anything in New York City, 
we have to get the IDC out because they are blocking it. They're cock blocking the fuck out of us. Like even something like the DSA is working on right now. Um, we're canvassing for universal rent control mm -hmm. and we're working on tenants organizing and tenants rights. And in order to get any kind of housing legislation passed, we have to go through Albany first yeah. because the city made that rule. What uh, the state made that rule what, in the seventies when the city was more progressive than the state. There's been yeah. so they, many, they that, have sovereignty over us right. because we are still a part of New York state and that takes precedence over New York city. So if we want to get any of this stuff done, we are working with the electoral working group to help anybody who's willing to run against the IDC people in a primary. Yeah. So which is why I mean, I, so it's because it's exactly because of efforts like yours that I'm, I'm much more excited about um, candidates like like DSA um, um, candidate Julia Salazar running for state senate, um, and um, and even liberals like um, Jessica Ramos in Queens running for state senate as well. Like all these people who are challenging the IDC. Like I, I think that uh, on the throughout Brooklyn and Queens, I think that's um, ultimately um, more important than Cynthia Nixon, but still um, more power to her for making Cuomo miserable. And, and, and parenthetically, this is one of the inspiring things about the post Bernie campaign is that they're always young people with pretty good politics are running for office at all levels. And Hell yeah. you know, this could be you know, beginning early stages of a really long term transformation of, of the nature of official American politics. We still need lots of stuff outside the electoral system, but you know, it's better to have sure. better people in office than worse people in office. So let's, uh, let's have a, a little bit, uh, a look, kind of a broader picture now of uh, the Democratic Party and liberals and what's happening in general. I think one of the things that the Sanders campaign did was reveal the mainstream of the Democratic Party for what it is. Like they'd always said, oh, we'd like to have all these kinds of social democratic policies, but we can't really because of the Republicans. And Sanders brought forward the popularity or potential popularity of that kind of agenda. And people like Hillary and her surrogates were forced to run against it. So you had people like uh, John Lewis saying, you know, no, no free college tuition. You don't get anything for free in America. Right. This is uh, the famous uh, civil rights leader. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then you know, Hillary herself, like running against single payer because you don't get anything for free in America. You need skin in the game. And she right. or, or she continued to insist that it will never, ever happen. This is not even Denmark. as people right. were presenting many plans for how it could happen. Yeah. I mean, it's completely plausible. Like at you a know. certain point in time, you have to ask, why are you being so negative about this? <laughs> but it, it forced him to show just precisely how terrible their politics really are. Yeah. And now they have nothing positive to run on. And all they can do is run on Trump is bad, which is unarguably true. <laughs> and then Russia, Russia, Russia. Uh, it's just like it's Trump, Russia, Trump, Russia, Trump, Russia. That's all they have to say for themselves. Uh, now, I'm told that people who actually go out and listen to people campaigning you know, out there in the real America... Uh, they're actually running on things better than they get coverage for. Yeah. So a lot of these fairly conservative Democrats, who, like Connor Lamb, who've won against uh, Republicans in solidly Republican districts, have run in defense of public education and free college tuition and single payer, defending Social Security and Medicare, this sort of thing. That's not getting the coverage. So there is some better stuff going on than we're seeing uh, in the media. But on the other hand, the National Democratic Party, the leadership that people get on a, all the TV time, they have no decent politics at all. They're bankrupt and deranged. And I mean, as as someone who like I I could I could talk all day about how bad they are, but I would like to see in 2018 I would like to see some Republicans lose their seats. And if they just if the National Democrats just keep talking about nothing but Russia, which um, um, and 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 about um, absolutely nothing that materially affects. Um, any Americans' lives, um, I really question whether they're going to win. And um, and as um, as bad as they are, that distresses me. Yeah, <laughs> I would like fair. to see. And I want to see my rubles. <laughs> all this anti-Hillary work. Yeah, I haven't yeah. gotten a single ruble for all this. See, yeah, they automate. Dasha? We need a Dasha on the Black Sea, and Putin has really a, been remiss in coming yeah, through sure. with that. Yeah, sure. You're still <laughs> waiting for yeah. your yeah. rubles. You're our Slavic wink, Natasha. Wink. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah I think uh, actually, there's some website that analyzes your Twitter feed to determine mm -hmm. if you're a bot or not. Huh. And mine... Is that like hot or it not? It said there's a 10 out of 10 <laughs> chance, right? <laughs> bot not or not. Upload a photo of your avatar. I got a 10 out of 10 bot, bot rating on my Damn, Twitter Damn, wow. Nice. So they've been able to automate you, but they can't automate the delivery of your ruples. That's just really fucked up, you know? No, those they should Russians. really work on that. 
So Looper. I have a couple pieces of sound that are related to what we were just talking about. Um, I think we're just going to skip on over this Comey interview because I feel like everyone's sick of it. Yeah, uh, fucking yeah. Comey. Yeah. Yeah. No. I can't stand that guy. So Fuck that guy. Would you like to start with the uh, pageantry of wokeness or let, the uh, <laughs> hashtag resistance in well, Russia? Let, let, I, I'm intrigued by let, pageantry of wokeness. Before right. we jump uh, right over Comey, um, and we, certainly we should skip the sound because I don't want to look at that fucker's face. I don't want to hear his fucking <laughs> voice. Um, and he's on a big oh, fucking tour right he now. He does look like a Protestant. Uh, right. Uh, oh, that's Pompeo. Oh, that's Pompeo. Oh, oh that's not Comey. He's, I know. They all look the same. They all look awful. They all look the same. Like, all this defense of Comey, right? Again, this this shows, I think, just a real lack of... Uh, Cops fucking, and prosecutors will save us. Right, yeah. In the deep state, you know, the CIA is all of a sudden fucking liberal's best friend. Yeah, I just took, again, 10 seconds of fucking Googling to look in and see who this Comey character was and the things uh, that this now this hero of uh, the left, uh, so quote-unquote left, uh, where he comes from. Um Let's just rattle off some things. So in 2005, when he was the deputy attorney general, uh, he endorsed a memorandum that approved the use of 13 enhanced interrogation uh, techniques, uh, including waterboarding. So that was a real stand-up thing. Wait, that, enhanced uh, interrogation. Is that's that torture. when they just ask torture. you over and over again <laughs> really nicely? Yes, that's that. And then they, they simulate drowning. But they start off asking very nicely. Um, so all of us, you know, I, I think we're pretty worldly, right? Let's let's imagine that he had a, a break uh, in his uh, public service career. Let's imagine uh, what two industries it could have been that Comey went to go work at and uh, make uh, fourteen, yeah, fourteen million dollars uh, over the course of five years. Which industries? Anyone? Um, private equity. Boom. All right, get the you get a car. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yes, private equity. Uh, Comey went, uh, this hero, uh, went to go work for Bridgewater Associates, uh, Associates mm. of Connecticut. Oh, Ray Dalio, yes. Invest oh, you know them. Oh, no, they're right. very you're, famous. You're on the yeah. Capitol beat. Yeah, so, yes, so you managed to get that. Uh, so if he's, you know, he's doing this uh, approving of uh, enhanced interrogation, what other industry might he have made some mm. good money off of? Oh. I'm going to go with military contracting. You get a car. Oh. Jamie Peck, you came up with the other one. Uh, it was, I did not know that ahead of time. Nah, I know you didn't. It, this was a surprise. Yeah, he made uh, lots and lots of money as not just the general counsel, but the senior vice president for that uh, lovely uh, liberal corporation, Lockheed Martin. The mm. largest defense contractor in the United States. So again, you know, these are the type of people that uh, become heroes when you are uh, not just deranged, uh, but you're completely opportunistic, have no politics whatsoever, except mm. trying to get um, Trump impeached so we could have Mike Pence, I guess. Mm. So that's I, I I don't think that I can let that stand on Comey without no, going and into even his by history. their own stupid standards, he's not great, right? Because he. Uh, probably did hurt Hillary Clinton's chances of winning a that's bit. My, that's my favorite thing, how he goes from being public and from like by all the same people, all the same group of liberal pundits, he goes from being public enemy number one to um, even being like our, 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 our greatest American hope. Well, and, then the Republicans did the opposite. Yeah. Like one day he's evil and then the next day he's great and the next day he's evil again. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's yeah, a real he's change. He's a malleable guy. That's he's all resistance. things to all people. <laughs> a, I mean, he's kind of always the same person, but he's a Rorschach of some sort. The Comey <laughs> like, test. Yes. That's a new psychological. But, yeah. but Obama was kind of a Rorschach a lot of ways. That's people yeah. projected lots of things up, but he's charming yeah. and interesting character. Yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. Comey is repulsive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, there is nothing appealing about him in any way whatsoever. And as Jamie has pointed out, um, he is a fucking cop. He's a yeah. Thank you. Cop. I got scolded for saying this on MR the other day, but this is our show, so we can curse as much as we damn and, yeah, well Mueller's please. Mueller's a fucking federal prosecutor. He's a fucking like, pros He's a fucking lawyer and a cop. Fuck and he lied that. about yeah. WMDs in Iraq. Well, there you go. Yeah. One more reason to hate. This is what separates. <laughs> all right, the the liberal left. All right, from the anti fada mindset. As soon as I hear. You know, deputy such and such. As soon as I hear FBI, the first thing that cops into my, that pops in my head, <laughs> cops in my head, cops is ACAB. All right, all cops are bastards. All, all right? cats fuck are beautiful. Fuck it, no, <laughs> fuck the police. No, no, awesome. As we used to say when shit was popping off in Greece, 
from New York to Greece. Fuck, fuck the, the police. police. Andy remembers that's that very it. well. That's it. So anyways, a lot of pig hate here, but go yeah, on. So <laughs> yeah, that's right. Digress. Yeah. So um, on, the, on a similar topic, uh, let's see. I guess, what should we do first? <laughs> Well, um, is being gay a perversion? I do want to know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess all these firings that Trump has been doing has given the Democrats a special chance to trot out these ghouls that he keeps nominating for a little public shaming, mm-hmm. a little public exposure of what they believe in and the ties that they have. And I, I think it's a little bit complicated, so I want to get you guys' take on this. But I'm going to play a little bit of Cory Booker fiercely grilling uh, Mike Pompeo, who's been nominated to be the new Secretary of State in his confirmation hearing. Is it 220 to 319? Oh, whoops. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Pompeo. I, I do want to just say again, I appreciate you coming by and showing me the respect and deference uh, to give me some time to yesterday so we can talk in private. You're most welcome. I, I want to pick up on one of the themes we talked uh, at length about, uh, and that involves many of your past statements uh, concerning Muslim Americans. And uh, perhaps I just want to start with some of your language. Um, Did uh, Booker work in a speech Wall you talked Street, about, or was he just uh, a shill for them? who uh, worshipped other gods and called it mar- multiculturalism. Um, uh, you sort of mourn that we live in a country where that happens. Um, do, do you have any views that the, the Muslim faith or people who believe in uh, worshiping, quote unquote, other gods, is that just uh, something negative in our country? No, Senator, I, I, uh, I, I, you can look at my record. You don't have to take my word for it here today. My, my record is uh, exquisite with respect to treating people of each and every faith with the dignity they deserve to protect their right to practice their religion or no religion, for that matter in the way that they want to. I, I've done that when I ran their aerospace and Century International. And, and Mr. My, my time is limited, so and, and I can just, follow just, up. But, it, but it's important because, because I, I've, heard these, I've heard these critiques, and, and you raised it yesterday. Um, I, I've worked closely with Muslim leaders, with Muslim countries. The CIA has saved countless thousands of Muslim lives during my 15 months. This is, this is at the core of who I am, Senator Booker. And Your words right now are really encouraging. Words do matter. It's not just actions. I'm going to pause him right there. Words do matter. It's not just actions. Do you think he has that in the correct order there? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's it's kind of funny. I mean, it's like um, it's almost like the way he's emphasizing it. It's as if words are more important than actions. I know, right? That's so weird. I'm really moved to learn that the CIA has been such a great friend of Muslims. I know. I I I think it's great how Pompeo is so woke on atheists. Mm. He keeps saying persons of no faith, which is you know um, I think pretty um, big of him. I I appreciate it. So I need to jump ahead a little bit because I'm not going to make you guys watch this whole eight minute long video. Does he ask him if he's a tool of the Cook brothers? He does not. Oh, uh, because he is. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> I mean, Sean's, Sean's peeing right now, so maybe I can pee too, and we'll pause it. But I, I will jump ahead and get it ready. So you think that Muslims in America who are in positions of leadership have a different category of obligation because of their religion. That's what I'm hearing you saying. I don't see it. Yeah, it's not an obligation. It's an opportunity. Muslims okay, so need it's interesting because I would agree with you that right. silence in the face of injustice, we've seen this in the Holocaust, we've seen this in the civil rights movement. Uh, I do agree with you that silence in the face of injustice uh, uh, lends strength to that injustice. Um, I, I do have a problem, though, when you start creating, oh, dicing up American people and saying certain Americans, I don't care if it's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or Muslims that serve on my staff, that they're in positions of leadership that suddenly have a special obligation. Um, uh, I do believe, though, yes, Senator, I have here over 20 times, and he has talked about Muslims' question, who, who would buy by the adherence of their faith should be considered should be tried for acts of sedition and should be prosecuted. Did you remain silent when you were on his show? Did you ever question? Because I have a lot of his statements here. His answer is not important. I mean, what I really want to highlight there is the uh, repeated use of call out. Yes. Right, to to yes. denote some sort of political action. Woke Corey, man. Yeah. yeah. It seems like Cory Booker, Booker is really um, trying to appeal to um, his young, uh, a young internet-y base. Well, he is really active on Twitter, or was, wasn't he? Is he? I believe so. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. So, yeah. yeah, very savvy guy. Uh, like Cuomo, I think you know he's been looking to do a presidential run for a long time. Yeah, yeah. 
it's comical too. Like I love the idea, like that Mike Pompeo would call out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 like I will not stand for this. <laughs> oh my god! I mean, that's what they want. <laughs> like that's what the Never Trumpers are, right? It's yeah. pure pageantry of wokeness. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. oh, David Frum is woke now. Mm-hmm. He's our friend. Um, there's another clip I'm not going to play because we don't have time, but I'll just describe it to you, which is that. Um, this guy, Cliff Schechter, had David Frum on his podcast, and he's also a contributor to the Majority Report, not as often as he used to be. But um, Sam was really taking him to task for this the other day, and his only defense was Russia, Russia, Russia. Mm-hmm. Liberal derangement syndrome. Yeah. It's a real thing. Yes. It's a real thing. Yeah. So um, I know you guys have to go, so I think we should jump ahead a bit to the getting casual segment on the sound sheet um and take my shoes off (laughs) make yourself yourself comfortable comfortable. make yourself at home put that wyatt coke shirt on just so you feel loose (laughs) like you're in the (laughs) discotheca and one thing i wanted to ask is how did you two you leftist power couple how did you get together that's a let me just jump in too that's a great question because i think that you know oftentimes because you both have very public platforms and you're relatively well known on the left. You know, you're asked to give these sort of official pronouncements on important <laughs> things. But we on the Antifada always want to know, you know, who people are. How the personal is political. Like, what are we right. fighting yeah. for? Yeah, what are we fighting for if not creating more uh, socialist power couples in the world? So, <laughs> <laughs> so how did you become a socialist power couple? I think we first uh, talked, well, uh, you were a fact checker at The Nation in, mm-hmm. what, 91? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. called me about something or other and... Uh, mm-hmm. You stuck in my mind for years afterwards. It's Eliza Featherstone. I see your byline. There's Eliza Featherstone. But we finally had our first conversation uh, and, uh, at a, a book party in 1997. So many of our yeah. friends get together at, at book parties. I know. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a cliche. Yeah. <laughs> for Comer and Melamed's Pink by Numbers book, it was actually, <laughs> which was pretty funny. They did a survey of what people like in art and then created paintings that look like it. So, you know, our yeah. first date was at a book party, babe. That's true. Remember? You're right. Yeah. Oh. We even slow danced. But I was that. married at the time, and Liza had a girlfriend, and we were, um, it was all scandalous and, and huh. complicated. But we, so we began having lunch. We had lunch, yes. We, yeah. We, How we, very we, proper. Yes. We, and, <laughs> and, 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 and I think we had, we had lunch for like two years. Yeah. Like, like we literally like had, had lunch. That's not a euphemism for no. something? No. I mean, I, I realized some, there's lunch and there's lunch, <laughs> but we literally were having like no quotation lunch. There wasn't like a, a pay by the hour hotel room involved at all no, or anything no, like that? No, That's actually no. really sweet. No, we so, actually, so, we had lunch, we had lunch for several years and then uh, we, uh, we really realized, um, we should do more than have lunch. Yes, after that's a while. Great. But it, yeah, yeah, it did take a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. that's wonderful. And now, um, not only have you been married for a bit, but uh, you also have a family. Yes. We, ha- so we have a twelve. You have a red something. diaper child. Wow. <laughs> we have a yeah, you know, we he's getting an, uh, he's getting bad advice on YouTube. So oh, the, oh he's no. on that cesspool. Political reeducation. Oof. Dude, YouTube well, is so scary. And like, well, people... he watches. He loves hockey, so he watches a lot of hockey videos. So we think maybe. They get, you know, the white bro suggestions. As I right. think ah, so. Yeah. I think white, I, I think that because, like, because hockey players are assumed, to, hockey fans are assumed to be white males, which is not unfair. Um, and um, a, the algorithm thinks that they're going to be interested in very conservative <sighs> politics. So he gets, so he'll, he'll say these, um, he'll say these things that are definitely right wing talking points, and I'll be like, "No, you know, kiddo, I know you must have gotten that from a YouTube video." And he'll be really defensive. He'll be like, "No, that's my <laughs> own opinion." Yeah. It's like, it's like I don't know. You went to an elementary school with, um, with, with a gender neutral bathroom, <laughs> trans identified children. Like, so I, I'm pretty well, sure you got pr- this from YouTube. Pretty sure <laughs> your uh, analogy with uh, lobsters and hierarchy <laughs> didn't come uh, directly. Directly from whole cloth out of yes, your twelve-year-old He's not watching head. Jordan Peterson yet. Well, that's good. Mm, but I think no, he does catch little good. Alex Jones now. And then. Ooh, no. Alex Jones, our friend. YouTube Alex. is so scary it's very it because, is. like, it's kids' main source of information these days, it's true. and it's totally dominated by right-wing crazy people. Yeah. yeah. The comments. Oh my God, you can't even read. Uh, that's what I, 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 I never read comments. Of... It makes me lose faith with human experiment. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> the YouTube comments are a uniquely they... bad part of the internet. They are. The band War on Women actually made a song based on YouTube comments on one of their songs. Really? Yeah. That's that's an interesting way to uh, 
create some lyrics? Yeah. yeah. We should maybe, we could put that maybe in like the outro music. Or I couldn't like do that. it on my show because there is just too obscene. Um, but since you're not under FCC right now, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we could throw that right in. Yeah. 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 Make a note of this. Uh, That's good political punk, too. I like, you know, a lot of political music sucks, but War and Women is pretty good. Oh, let's mm-hmm. talk a little bit about punk rock, too, because. Um, wait, wait, I'm not done yet. Uh, with I raising, wait, I wanted to ask about um, raising children under capitalism because this is something that Sean mm-hmm. and I talk about a lot when trying to decide if we want to have any kids ourselves. Yeah. One like, kid, perhaps. It's, yeah, perhaps one, perhaps, you know, see how we do go from there. Perhaps a brood. But like, <laughs> it's just so scary to me to think about like all the shit that I have to deal with in mm-hmm. this rapidly degrading hell world. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. like, what's uh. it going to be like 20 years from now? Well, yeah, I really want to bring a child I, you know, into this mess. About, you know, yeah. Climate's the big one, honestly. It is. You know, like we're really handing over a bag of shit to you, kid. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, I mean, as long as this is, again, a very anti fada thing, but as long as we have capitalism, which, you know, the entire notion is of infinite growth, right? Uh, uh, but of course, it's on a finite planet. Um, I don't have any faith whatsoever that there's going to be some sort of green capitalism uh, without heavy intervention by social movements and mm-hmm. perhaps the state. Yeah. Uh, but even then, it might be a little too little too late. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that I think that's a question that looms large. Um, I'm sure even for you as parents, right? And for us as people well, potentially. You know, we're all aware of that, but I think we just set it aside. Uh, and just having a kid, we love him a lot. And um, having a kid is just a marvelous experience. It has <laughs> it has its complications and difficulties for sure, but it's just been uh, it's made me a better person. Uh, and uh, you know, I understand all the political worries that people have about having a kid, but um, I don't know. The the personal seems to outweigh that. I think another I think another thing is the climate is definitely um, is is definitely um, scary. Um, and um, and the and the condition of the world is um, obviously very troubling, and that's why we're all extreme leftists um, and yes. trying to um, do something about it. Um, but I also think that um, that sometimes as leftists, we really um, believe our we start to believe our own propaganda about w- how bad the world is, and we think we really have to turn that up as loud as possible, or people won't listen. Mm. You know that, and so, so we think, oh, we you know we have to. We have to talk about how bad things are and how things are getting worse, or you know, in, in order to really alarm people. And then we start to really um, believe that. But the world is not all on a constant um, incline towards um, worseness. Like there are a lot of things that um, that, um, that 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 do get better uh, over time. There are um, fatal diseases that used to kill millions of people that we don't suffer from anymore. Um, there are um, um, there are um, there are species that um, are ha- have been brought back from the edge of endangerment. <laughs> you know, we get very depressed about the polar bears, but the giant panda is doing great thanks to Chinese government intervention. <laughs> right. I mean, and you know, and we don't really tell those stories because we think, oh my God, we've got to really upset everyone. Um, and and I think in some ways, we, um, when we think about whether to have um, whether to have children or not, we we need to um, you know we need to somewhat realistically um, look at um, you know the the way the world is um, is um, not always getting worse, but also sometimes getting better, and that um, human beings actually are smart enough to solve these problems, and we wouldn't be leftists if we didn't think that they were right. We're we're leftists because we think that these problems. Um, can be addressed and can be solved and that it's worth um, being politically engaged. And when you have children, you actually want to, you, you want to solve those problems even more. I could see that. Yeah. It's one more incentive. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Which makes me think that one of the things that the left has done in the last couple of decades, is just become a gloom machine. Uh, Mm -hmm. And, uh, all sense of utopianism has been lost uh, for various reasons, and uh, it's it's sad. We have uh, we, we should be able to uh, try to persuade people that the world could be a much better place than it is. And if we just you know harp on how miserable things are, and God knows there's a lot of misery in the world, and God knows myself, I'm temperamentally very uh, oriented towards gloom. <laughs> it's, it's easy for me to take the gloomy way out. But Same. you know, really, we do need to like get back in touch with the idea of. Uh, 
you know, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but mm. your chains. That's a good thing. You know? Yeah. As Susie Bright once told me, that's an erotic sentiment. <laughs> and I, I think kids usually have a better read on these things that people think sometimes. Like they certainly, I mean, I don't have any kids, so correct me if I'm wrong, but they have a certain like inherent sense of fairness. They're big oh, on yeah. fairness. Yep. And sometimes when you explain something to a kid, you realize all over again how fucked up it is. Yeah. Um, right. Years ago, um, the, I um, I um, interviewed this guy who'd been a Iraq veteran and was very active in in the anti-war movement. And um, and you know he's and he had a, a young daughter. And he said that's he said exactly what you just said that when you have to explain something like war and geopolitical politics to a kid, you realize how horrifying it is. It you know, it just it just it just makes you it it confirms. You, you know those kinds of um, commitments for you even more, um, and I also think, uh, I mean, and this is like, I mean, people don't really like when you point this out, but um, r the right, most right wing elements in our world, right, religious fundamentalist, climate deniers, um, you know, people deeply committed to ra um, gender inequality, <laughs> you know, um, those people have no qualms about having oh children. Oh my God, so many children. I mean, children. they are yeah. really, part, it's part of their ideology to populate the world. It is, yeah. So if, if we were, as a left, to become politically committed to not having kids <laughs> or politically discouraged from having kids, I, I just don't think we should necessarily cede um, biological <laughs> the or reproductive social future. reproduction <laughs> to them. Yeah. I think that's probably a, unwise. That, that's fair. That's so, a good point. Because, yeah. like, I was thinking about this in terms of uh, how having kids it necessarily is labor in the service of capital. Right. Literally. Oh, it is. And how for sure. capital mm. has ruined so many of the things that I like already. But not ruined them, but mm. just, mm. you know, used them to its own nefarious ends, like writing. I like to write. Uh, I don't like having to write for a living so that other people can make money off of extracting my mm -hmm. surplus value. Or just like simple things like cooking mm -hmm. i know yeah. you go in for social reproduction theory so I you do. know that this mm -hmm. stuff is all part of the same mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exploitative sure. hole uh sex mm -hmm. another thing i mm -hmm. tend to enjoy that is <laughs> also performed in story service checks capital. out and Absolutely. i imagine <laughs> the joy of having a child would be even worse than that because not it's not just me anymore like i'm bringing a precious life into the world that is then going to be ground down under the gears of this capitalist machine. But maybe I could also think of it like I'm not just having a child in service of capital, but in service of defeating capital. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. And it's also um, a, one of life's joys, and you don't want to let them take that away. That, yeah. You know. that's... I think at the end of the day, um, I mean, you can make a list of pros and cons, as I've tried to do many times. <laughs> it's a very hard, that's a very hard pro and con list to it's make. It's not, uh, at the end of the day, it's not a rational choice. You do it because you feel like it. Absolutely. It is uh, not a rational choice. I, and never has been in any historical period. Yeah, isn't right. I mean, it's always like uh, it's always a little bit of a crazy thing to do. That's well, why I never wanted a kid, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I got together with Liza, and she did, and I said, "Oh my God, what am I going to do?" So <laughs> <laughs> I did it with any self-respecting Upper West Sider to see a shrink. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're and all it pro took after, after about here. three years. You know, I straightened my head out. <laughs> Sean thinks I need to see a shrink for my irrational phobia of giving birth, but oh, I think that's incredible. That. Rational. No. I mean, I, does it, giving birth suck it, as much as they say it does? I mean, I I, I enjoyed it, um, but um, why is it enjoyed? I, it? I, 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 I did. I did. Oh, wow. did Sean so, put you up to this? So, <laughs> I no, swear we, we, we did not we did talk not before this. this. <laughs> um, I I read this really um, wonderful hippie text called Spiritual Midwifery. Wow. And um and and it's it is literally the best thing that you can read when you're pregnant because it is all these hippie ladies and their testimony <laughs> of so me and my old man or like <laughs> you know like and like and you know and they're like It's um, hilarious reading because they make it into a sensual mm -hmm. delight. Yeah, yeah, they're what? on this farm in Tennessee, they're fooling around before giving birth. <laughs> like, I mean, it's a little unrealistic although it is all true, I think. Um but um but it's still like like it, it sort of puts you in this frame of mind that oh it's this is all kind of natural people have been doing this for a long time and it might even be kind of an interesting experience um, and I feel like we don't really 
hear that perspective that much um, in in this sort of um, bitter post hippie world. And thanks to technology, yeah. you're really not likely to die from doing it either. Well, that's that's, true. that's a huge thing. I think you know, in terms of uh, you, you brought up a really good point, which is that. Most people throughout history didn't think about it. I think even mm -hmm. if you go back to like mm -hmm. a generation or two ago, it wasn't even a question about right. are we going to have children or not. It's just something that you did normally in your early 20s. Right. Right. It's just was and expected of you. And I and think by even the way, I think it's good that people now regard it as a choice. Yes. And that you don't yeah. have to. And I think that is really um, speaking of ways the world of God has gotten much better. I think that is a way. Are you saying women that have the women the have choice? made some women have made some progress. And, and, and well, that's and a all, consequence. I would even not Larry Summers agrees with this. you. And also, problem. you know, I think, <laughs> you know, not just on the women's reproductive rights side and their ability to make that choice but in terms of um gender relations it becomes a discussion that the man and the woman have together you right, know right, right. So, which is a yeah. it's or the a man huge, and the man or the man the yeah, woman, thank you woman, yeah no that's a, that's Absolutely. a very good point yeah. and i would say too that you know if you were uh thinking about having kids in the in the year uh 999 you know, 1000, the year 1000, the millennium was supposed to be the apocalypse. There's all these apocalyptic, you mm -hmm. know, movements happening in right, Europe. Right. right? right, right. But uh, people still chose to have kids anyway yeah. in the face of this um, catastrophism. So I think that you made a good point about we on the left are always pushing things are so bad. And that's a rhetorical device, this catastrophism. Mm -hmm. But then another great rhetorical device uh, that we've had lately is uh, fully automated luxury gay space communism, yes. which is kind <laughs> of, a <laughs> again, it's, yeah. it's a very, you know, it, it's very shallow. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's very much a meme, right? But I think it also points to uh, this conception that we all have that the left does not have to be dour. Right. It does not have to be doomy. It does not have to be, you know, this sort of Stalinist, uh, you know, work camp um, uh, future and it could actually be one where human beings get all the things that uh, they need to survive yeah. we have uh, equality amongst people socially in terms of gender and race and everything yeah. like that and so if you look at that opposite rhetorical thing not the catastrophism but if you look at the uh, fully automated luxury space communism aspect of things that's a reason to bring a child into the world because mm -hmm. we want to again like you said uh, create a, um, a future as leftists that our children would want to live in yeah. and our children would enjoy to live in. Mm -hmm. And we need to create not just for ourselves, but also for future generations yeah. of humanity. I mean, we were Definitely. talking about this the other day uh, in reference to like, how do you deal with the immensity of the task before us? Once mm -hmm. you figure out that capitalism is a rotten system that needs to end, uh, but also knowing that we will probably not live to see this happen, either because right. we will die before it starts to happen or because we'll die in the first wave of it. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm definitely going down on the first wave, on the first I, set of parents. Maybe by having kids, like a little part of us could live to see that, maybe. Absolutely. Wait, if you yeah. go back to the late 70s, the Harvard Business Review did a survey of its readers and found that most of the CEOs and senior managers who read the Harvard Business Review uh, thought that their children or grandchildren would live under socialism and that capitalism wow. was doomed. That was wow. like the late 70s. You know, it's less, it's about 40 years ago we're talking about. So the, um, our, our sense of the future and what's possible is completely reversed compared to just 40 years ago. So who knows what could happen 40 years from now? It's not that hard to imagine a climate like the 70s coming back. I mean, it, w where this, uh, where the CEOs are on the defensive in that way. Well, big it's already been happening, right? Yeah. You re a... you reposted that thing. It's like I feel like once a week now we see some fancy CEO person saying <laughs> that expressing their fears about uh, mm -hmm. proletarian revolution. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think a lot of them are afraid their thirds are going to get slit as they sleep. And that is a great thing because yeah. you yes. know this is what I think progressives miss a lot of the times is that that sentiment on the on behalf of the ruling class, even if it doesn't bring us, you know, to socialism or communism, just scaring the shit out of those people is going to get you the reforms that, you know, these technocratic liberals want. Yeah, if they're afraid right. that their heads are going to be yeah. on pikes, then perhaps they'll give concessions. Absolutely. And I, you know, the, the either that or they'll call out the army. Well, yeah, I mean, the probably a little from column A, a little from column yeah, B, yeah. but I think that certainly, um, and perhaps we should leave it off here. Uh, I think that we, um, are in a cycle of struggles, as they like to say, in the left mm -hmm. com, in the left com world, mm -hmm. uh, that started with the crisis, which is God, ten years ago now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, picked up with uh, Occupy Wall Street, this kind of first 
blooming of uh, resistance. And now we're seeing that take a kind of more coherent political form in uh, Sandersism and Corbynism. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we on the extreme left mm -hmm. <laughs> believe that we need to go beyond that. Right. But perhaps, you know, when we look back on things in 20, 30 years, if we haven't blown ourselves up by goading Russia into going nuclear uh, in Syria, uh, we'll see this as um, a beginning of a phase where we as working people, we as people on the left, not just in the United States, but all over the world, uh, start to not only gain the consciousness that something needs to change, and ha but also gain the organizational and the institutional power to not just make the ruling class afraid, 